Okay. Hello, welcome back to the semester and welcome back to our first lecture series. We are glad to have with us today Friedrich Fraundorfer from the Graz University of Technology in Austria. And he has, he's an expert on vision and drones. He has been educated in Graz where he got his PhD and then he went out to a number of labs. He worked in Kentucky with David Mister, who is now the uh, leading in media research. He has worked uh, with um, in North Carolina and ETH with, um, what's his name? Mark Polifus. Mar Mark Polifus, yes. who is heading the, the um, Microsoft. Microsoft, the Microsoft HoloLens 2 project, right? And finally, he has also worked with Scaramuzza, whom some of you may remember, who was here a few uh, months ago talking about drones. But he is leading in Graz a big research group. He has a number of European projects, which you probably will mention. He also is involved in international collaboration, and we are lucky he just came to the States to work on uh, in an IAPA collaboration. And so he will be talking about his research today. So the floor is open to Friedrich. Thank you very much, Cornelia, for this nice introduction. I am very happy to be here. And it's really glad to having the opportunity to talk to you. So as the title suggests, uh, I, will talking, I will be talking about drones today and computer vision today. So when I talk, when I talk about drones, I mean small-scale unmanned aerial systems, something like this. So I'm not talking about big drones, I'm talking about uh, quite small-scale drones, some flying robots. So these drones, they are very well known in general public already, so almost everyone uh, has a drone and for pri private use, and I guess many drone enthusiasts might be amongst you, right? So everybody knows these drones, and they are also used in a lot of applications in the meantime, industrial applications, professional activities, like, for instance, inspection tasks. You also definitely know all these big plans for drones, like you want to have Amazon deliver packages with drones, Google wants to do this, so these are big plans. And these plans, I guess they will come true, but they need drones that are, well, autonomous, that work autonomous, that are intelligent. So these are not the simple drones that you buy from DJI right now that you use for piloting, but these drones, they need to be uh, autonomous and more intelligent machines. And this is also what I am interested in. I want to make such <coughs> drones smart, intelligent, and for this they need some specific components. They need processing, on board and they need some sensing of the environment to be able to interpret the environment, react to the environment and move and navigate in this environment. And this is where I think uh, computer vision will play, will play a really big role in there because cameras are perfect centers for drones, they are lightweight, they are very small. Of course they need some processing power to work with them, but they are ideal for actually producing uh, small-scale drones with a lot of sensing capability. And also, uh, image sensors give a lot of data. You can recognize objects, but you can also do geometric measurements. So they are very versatile sensors. So this is why I think computer vision uh, are ideal sensors for drones, and they will play a big role in these autonomous drones. So, this is basically the introduction. So, what do we do with drones at our lab right now? So, I, have, I would like to start this presentation with a short video. So, one of our student projects is, this is running in our drone lab that we have at our university. And this is actually a drone that uh, avoids an object thrown at it. So, here you let's start this video quite quickly. So you see a small ball and the drone is avoiding it. So if this was too fast for you, now uh, have, a, have again a visualization of this with some uh, 
visualization in the ROS interface. You can look at it again if you did not uh, see it right. So it's a small ball held in the hand, and when it's thrown at the drone, it's detected, the trajectory is computed, and if an impact is imminent, then the drone is moving out of the way. So this is one of our activities, uh, just as a motivation in the beginning. Um, but before I actually go more into some technical details and continue with the talk, I would like to take the opportunity to tell you a little bit about um, my place. So I'm from the Graz University of Technology. So this is a university in the second largest city in Austria. It's around 200 years old. And we have about 12,000 students and 2,900 uh, people staff there. So it's not a very small place, but also not a very big place. I'm, a, I'm based at an institute, which is a lab, uh, which is the home of seven professors. So we have Professor Schmalstig, Professor Tom Pock, Professor Bischoff, me, Professor Lepetit, Professor Kalkoven, and Professor Steinberger. So half of us are working in the computer vision area, while the other half is sort of working in computer graphics, or basically on common projects there. I'm sort of the only one that is also working with robots there. And mainly with drones, we don't have ground robots, but we only work with, with the flying robots with drone in this sense. My team, the team that is working on these drones and on computer vision for drones, uh, consists currently of, you know, of these eight people. So we have a postdoc, Jesus Pestana, who's working on drone navigation, and he's accompanied by seven PhD students working on different projects related to this. And of course, most of the work that they will tell you today, that they will show you today, is actually done in collaboration with my students here. One thing that I would like to mention is uh, my particip participation in some past research projects that you maybe might know. So, I was actively involved in development of the PIXEC, PIXHOP platform. So this included the controller, this included the framework, the PX4 flow uh, system. So I was basically working with Lawrence Meyer during the whole time at ETH in the development of this. And I'm really happy that this initiative got that successful as it is right now. Uh, then I also was part of the SFLAP project. So this was a project to, well, develop vision based helicopters, so this was together with David Escarmutzas, he, he also was on this, on this project, and well, we are very happy that this project got features at one, at one issue of the Robotics and Automation magazine, but uh, did not only work on drones, so my work also to it work on self-driving cars, so we had a recharge project, the idea was to build a self-driving car that was mainly using cameras, so at this time, this was basically new, and this was a co collaboration with Volkswagen. So we had cameras in all the directions, and we were computing, uh, we were computing maps and doing navigation with these cameras on board there. So I will just mention these projects. I will not talk about them. I will talk about more recent projects, but I, I wanted to know so that you see where my background comes from. So the further outline uh, for today uh, is as follows. So first I will talk about some efforts that we do, some research work that we do uh, about computer vision for drone navigation. So this includes uh, one concept that I would like to mention, the IMU-assisted computer vision for eagle motion estimation. Then I would like to present uh, one of our recent, most recent works about edge-based SLAM system, pre-SLAM. Uh, then I would like to talk about some projects about safe navigation of drones and acquisition planning for, for drone image capture. So these two things have directly to do with drones. And, well, if time permits, then I also would like to show some projects, some videos about some projects that we did with drones there. This includes some aerial inspection, some uh, delivery drone, and an inventory drone project that we are working on. Okay, now let's start with this first topic. I'm you assisted computer vision for angle motion estimation. So uh, if you have some questions, uh, feel free to interrupt me and ask me.
So angle motion estimation is of course really important for drones. You want to know, you want to track where the drone is moving around. You want to measure this motion. And doing this with cameras is of course a very good idea. But of course cameras can be uh, unreliable. So most times these cameras are combined with an IMU. And this makes a lot of sense because IMUs are anyway available on drones because they need this for the low level control. So one of the standard methods for computing angle motion uh, is actually to detect features in two consecutive images, match them, and then compute uh, the motion parameters from this by computing an essential matrix or doing something else, doing some structure from motion thing. So this is one commonly used concept. It's still used, it still works fine. Uh, and this concept can be fused to with some IMU measurements to make it more robust. So there are a couple of ways of doing this, and I would like to present one idea uh, that I basically proposed of doing this. So one, there's a standard way of doing this data fusion for, from IMU uh, motion estimation measurements and computer vision measurements, and this is a so-called, or is often referred to as a loosely coupled approach. You have an IMU, this computes accelerations, rotational velocities that can be integrated, and a vision system that produces poses. And then you fuse them with a filter, like an extended Kalman filter, for instance. This is a loosely coupled approach. So this was actually used in the s flight project, and Stefan Weiss was involved in actually doing this or creating such a system here. <coughs> There's a, another way of doing this, a uh, more recent way, is a, often referred to as a tightly coupled approach. This is where you actually uh, do the estimation together in one framework. So this can be actually depicted as such a uh, factor graph here where you have IMU measurements, you have some key point measurements from the vision system, and you estimate the poses and speed and IMU biases and 3D landmarks in an optimization scheme. So this optimizer could be a Kalman filter, it also could be a nonlinear optimization system. So uh, works from Leutnecker would be one example for doing this. So this is a, a very nice approach, but it really relies on high quality key point measurements, a lot of them. If they're not robust, the whole machine does not work well. So this is a little bit of a drawback, and it's of course computationally, uh, it takes a lot of computation time typically doing this. So I have some additional proposition how this could be done and one idea would be actually to use this IMU measurements to actually help the vision system to perform better, to be more reliable and more robust and producing better results that then can be fused uh, in a fusion approach. And I call this an IMU assisted vision method so the IMU AIDS assists the vision system in producing good results. And the idea would be that this would lead to more efficient and more reliable computer vision estimates that can be trusted, that actually then can be fused in a simpler way, in a more reliable way with IMU data. So in this idea actually uh, was used by me in a couple of projects, leading to quite a number with a variety of algorithms, uh, of new algorithms that use this concept. So, well, here's a, and in the meantime, already outdated list of them. So these are all ego motion, absolute pose estimation algorithms that use IMU inputs to actually produce, to help, uh, to help the, the vision algorithm to produce better results here. So I will not go, I will not talk about all of them, but I will actually highlight one of them to explain you more about this concept, how this concept works. And uh, this would be the two, the three point relative motion estimation, uh, which computes a relative motion between two camera images by knowing something from an IMU. So here's an illustration about this idea. So it's about relative motion estimation. We will have, we assume that we have two cameras, so these quadrilaterals are cameras, we have an image like here, and this camera is moved 
and, and rotate it to a second position. And we would like to compute the rotation and translation between them. And we can do this from point from feature matches between these two cameras. Well, this is known. This is in such a general motion case. You need five point correspondences. Then you can compute this motion. So the translation is up to scales. You cannot recover the absolute distance here. So you only have two parameters for translation. So this is why five point correspondences are enough for this. When you now attach an IMU to this camera, this IMU can measure the gravity vector. So you always would know how your camera is aligned to this gravity vector. So it measures actually two rotations. And you can use these measurements now to actually transform this general motion system into a simplified um, motion estimation problem. You could take the features, or the images and the features, rotate them such that you have a camera setting in which the camera points uh, in which the cameras are parallel to the gravity vector. In such a situation, the motion that remains is only an XYZ translation and one rotation angle. So only four parameters to estimate. And as the translation is, is up to scale, this would be three parameters that you can estimate. And you would only need three points for doing this. So instead of five. Having these three points, or only needing three points, uh, is a big benefit in terms of speed and efficiency and robustness. I will come to this uh, in a bit. So once you have this simplified problem, uh, you actually turns out that also the estimation process is simpler. I can show this to you with, with, with the next slide. So, Assume that we compute the essential matrix to actually compute this motion. So this essential matrix is a 3 by 3 matrix. It has nine entries. So if you have the general motion case, you need to estimate nine parameters there. You can do this with uh, five point correspondences and a couple, of, uh, polyn a couple of polynomial equations that form the inner constraints of this essential matrix. Now, if we look at the essential matrix for our simplified problem, so the essential matrix that describes this simplified motion here, then we see that this essential matrix with nine parameters estimated turns into this one. So we have one uh, entry zero, so it doesn't need to be estimated. We, oh, and then we only have six different parameters that we need to estimate. So the structure of the essential matrix gets simplified. So this means we can now define an algorithm, or derive an algorithm that solves for this remaining uh, parameters of this simplified structure. And for this, we only need three point parameters. So we did this, and we did this in a work that was published at ECCV already in 2010. And this was basically one of the first works on how to use uh, IMU measures to simplify uh, traditional uh, motion estimation problems. Also, another advantage is the five point algorithm, which the one is created by David Nister. Uh, produces 10 solutions, so this one produces only four solutions because the motion is simplified, is more, is simpler. So, but why is it important at all to reduce the five, the number of point correspondences from five to three? Does it make any difference? Well, it does. And it does because these algorithms are typically used in a robust estimator like RANSAC. So it means you need to run this algorithm a specific number of iterations to be robust. So you sample a subset of data points, compute the motion hypothesis, and you do this a couple of times until you find a good one. And the number of samples you need to take to have guaranteed that you get a good motion estimate depends exponentially on the name, number of data points. So this number of data points S is in here. And this, this equation actually leads to curves like this. So on this graph, what you see, you see plotted the number of samples that are needed depending on some specific uh, uh, guess for the number of outliers in the data. So typically in computer vision, we assume that you have 50% of outliers in there. This would be a good guess. So and if you don't, 
And uh, the five-point algorithm would lead to this green graph, and the three-point algorithm would lead to this graph. So if you now check how many iterations you need with the five-point algorithm, for this case, this would be about 125. But if you look at the three-point algorithm, you can solve this with about 20 iterations. So this means it's a really big speed up if you use only this three-point algorithm there. If you use this IMU measurements to aid in the computation of these computer vision measurements here. So this will lead to a more robust estimate. For instance, if you think about that, you have a fixed time budget for estimating the motion estimation. You say, okay, I can afford to run 100 iterations on my computer. Then by looking at the graphs, you know that this method is robust up to 60% of outliers, while this method is only uh, robust up to 45% of outliers. So the robustness of the method is increased as well. So this was basically the, the, the main idea about how to have, how to use IMU measurements, which we have in our drones to assist actually in the angle motion estimation using a computer vision algorithm. This was one example, the three-point algorithm for relative motion. Uh, I've also worked on multi-camera systems, so cameras that look around, computing the motion with them. So there also exists accelerations using some IMU measurements in there. Do you have a question? Uh, how about the noise in the IMU? Because when you move very little, very slowly, or when you move very fast, the IMU measurements are not that accurate, if it is not that expensive. Do you have any way of dealing with this? Yeah, that's a good point. So what we are using in here is we're using the gravity vector. So th actually, this gravity vector can be uh, computed quite accurately, even with cheaper IMUs. So this is what basically lets most drones hover. So we use these measurements, and even with uh, low-grade IMUs, the ones that we have in the drones, these measurements are precise enough to be used in there. And this is actually what we found out. So you don't need to be super precise there, uh, but it needs to be Typically what we have accuracy is between 0 0.1 degree and, 0 and 1 degree for the gravity normal and with such an estimate you can actually use these algorithms. Okay, so I will not go deeper into this topic, I just wanted to present you with this and if you're more interested there are How many publications. How long? Can this be real time? Oh yes, this is real time. This is really fast. I mean, the five-point algorithm is real-time. The three-point is faster than this. So this is absolutely real-time capable. So you might have noticed that so far I did not mention deep learning. I did not mention deep learning. I didn't talk about machine learning. So of course, nowadays I cannot give a talk and not talking about machine learning. So this is actually uh, what comes with my next topic a bit. So this was one way, doing feature matching to compute uh, ego motion estimation. Uh, they are still relevant, in particular when you have uh, low frequency cameras, when distances between the images are further apart, also for loop closing. Uh, but actually, if you have a stream of images with high frequencies, there are other methods that you also could use. And one of them are direct methods. So I'm not sure how familiar are with direct methods. So typically, um, feature-based methods where you extract and match features are called indirect methods for ego motion estimation. And direct methods, they don't need this feature extraction and matching step. So what they do instead is they uh, take two images and then warp one image with a estimated rotation and translation into the other and check for consistency. And then this rotation translation is optimized such that the consistency of the warping is maximized. 
So what it needs is it needs a similarity measure to check if the warping works well. And there's works from Daniel Kremers that was using photo consistency for doing this. So it's an optimization procedure that computes the photo consistency of uh, a current frame, which is warped with an estimated rotation translation into a keyframe, and checks the photo consistency between the warped image and the original image. But to do the warping, you don't need the depth. Yes, so for this, you need the depth. So this is why this approach works initially uh, is done with uh, depth cameras, where you can use the depth. Uh, or you could also think of estimating the depth as well. So there is an approach for this. But actually, if you have depth cameras, like in the real sense, then this is a very good way of computing visual geometry and computing slam. So it, this does not, it doesn't need feature extraction. It doesn't need uh, feature matching. So in we, uh, one of our recent work is, a, is such a system and that uses edge features for computing the costs, for computing the similarity, not photo consistency. Uh, the idea was that this would be beneficial because photo consistency is very, uh, depends a lot on brightness illumination changes. It's very precise, uh, but also the optimization of this cost function doesn't always converge very well. So we wanted to look into something that has a better conversion procedure, is more uh, invariant to illumination changes. So we looked at edge features in there. So we uh, devised a method that is called Rabel for robust edge-based visual odometry. And our recent work that was presented at ICRA this year actually uh, made this into a full SLAM system. Uh, this one is available at GitHub, it's open source, you can download it and try it, and it, it's set up to work with depth cameras. So if you have an intro real sense, if you have some other depth camera, it will work out of the box. You could also use a stereo system that produces some depth for, for this implementation. So how does, it, how does it work? What does it do? Uh, we have two images, and we have the depth maps for, for these images from our depth sensor, and then we extract some edge features and we try to align these edge features from a current frame into some keyframe by optimizing the rotation and translation there. So what we want to do is we would like to minimize the distances between these edge features so they should overlap. So how to do this? So to, we don't measure distances in there, but what we actually do is we use the distance, trans distance transform to compute the degree of overlap in there. So for one of the images, we compute the distance transform of this of such an edge map. Uh, and then we project the other image into this distance transform. And then we uh, count, actually, the, we add up all the values on this edge image, edge image. So if there's a perfect alignment, then these edges would be in these dark regions of the distance transformed image. And then the cost would actually be very low. And based on this cost, we optimize the rotation transformation to, to find the, the, the smallest cost in there. So this was, is an initial projection. And after optimization, it will look like this. So here, you can see that the optimized rotation translation, if it's correct, it projects these edges directly into these very dark areas where the costs are zero here. So this turns out to uh, work very well. Uh, now, I still did not mention machine learning. So what we did with, with machine learning in here is we used machine learning to actually see which edge features uh, we should use there. So we tried, uh, so in this approach, we tried a different number of machine learned edge features. And this is an advantage because if you use simple Kenny features, you get a lot of responses which might actually be uh, too much and they might be too close and they could be ambiguous. So if you use some machine learned edges, uh, that would work better. So we did some evaluation on this. Uh, right now, currently, which is not published, we are also trying to learn specifically edge features for this task. So edge features that not that are not with the task, with the, with the linearing object, but the edge features with the task that really perform well for this edge-based optimization, for this edge-based camera pose estimation. Just a quick question. 
how does this method deal with like moving objects in picture? Uh, would try to match the edges for those two and get disoriented? Uh, it's a good question. Of course, moving objects are a problem. So if your whole scene consists of moving objects, then it doesn't work well. So you need to have some static background. So if you have too many moving objects, uh, then the static background will, will be suppressed and you might get wrong estimates. So but what we do, on the other hand, is we're not just using uh, two frames, but we're also matching back to a couple of other frames. And we check which edges stay consistent, and then we use them preferred. So we give, we actually weigh these edges in some specific way, such that moving objects and moving edges that don't play such a big influence there. But it's a good point, of course. Another question. Yes? All the images you showed are for indoor images, right? So how well does this work out, though? Because it's just not that, like, not that structured, right? Well, edges don't need to be structured. Uh, the, the problem with depth cameras is that they don't work outdoors. So this is why we only have indoor images here. Outdoors, you need to have stereo, and you need to have the features close by. So of course, this is in any camera system. They need to be close enough to show some disparity. So, but in principle, of course, this can be used outdoors as well. OK, so we did some experiments with a simple setup. So we have a computer with some depth camera. And we actually did, created a real-time system that runs on this computer. So it does not need a GPU. So it fully runs on CPU in real time on such a, well, low power laptop, actually. So this is actually very interesting for us because it, that, that we don't need a big desktop. We don't need a GPU for running this algorithm. So we basically did some. Uh, it's sort of like a handheld device where we can do visual geometry in real time. So in terms of quality, uh, this works very well. So it's not a photo consistency measure, which would be very precise. So it's, it's edges which cannot give the same precision as photo consistency, but it has the advantage that it converges much quicker. And you can actually take frames or lower frame rates on the cameras. Uh, what we find is that we get very similar um, results in quality to many other systems, but actually with a, with a faster system, and we can actually really use camera streams with lower frame rates. So this is what you can see here. So these are typical errors that you get on typical benchmark sites. So this would be endpoint errors with four, six centimeters, one centimeter. Uh, similar things you will also get with other methods like DVO, which is one of the Kramer's groups, uh, and, and other things. So this works well. It works in real time on small computers. Or you can run it on tablets even. So this, I think, is, is very interesting. And the source code is available, so you could download this and try it yourself. OK. I now have a, a quick video of one of the scenes, how this looks like. So here it's used with the slam setting, so it also does loop closure in here. So you can see uh, the 3D points that are used. But these are the edges that are actually used, and they are visualized here. And you can see that we actually match back a, a couple of frames with these links to get more accurate pose estimates in this slam approach. So the yellow links are the links from the loop closure, which are used for the optimization of a pose graph. So we did not use this so far on a drone, but of course this would be uh, one very interesting use case. And we definitely will do this in the future. But I also ask you to try it yourself. OK. Uh, having uh, talked about this topic, I would like now to go a little bit more onto some drone applications directly. And one of the projects that I would like to highlight next is about safe navigation. So in, for this, we actually uh, use one of our smart drones 
a drone that has processing power, a drone that has a lot of sensors to do some safe navigation. You might notice that so this is a DGI research drone, the Matrice. Uh, we have some very nice processor on it, a, Jet a Jetson, not the most recent one, but actually nevertheless a very powerful one. Uh, we have a lot of stereo cameras, so this is a stereo system, and we have them in all directions, and they can be used for detecting obstacles, and they are used for navigation. So with such a drone, we can now do a lot of processing and the reasoning during what the flight. In all directions? Six? Yes. So but they, they are four, they are five actually. Four, left, right, forward, backward, and one down. So five. So there's no four upwards. So what we did, we implemented a, a, a user interface for safe navigation. So this drone uh, can be piloted by clicking on a map. Uh, with a mouse point instead of using some remote controls. And the drone will not go straight there, like in many other applications where you just click a GPS position, the drone goes straight, but it actually uh, will use a map to fly around obstacles. So with all these processing parts, we could, so we, we, we envisioned this for some search and rescue system where you actually want to fly through an area close on the ground. And the idea for this was that you go there, take your drone, move it up to a high altitude, take a couple of pictures to create on the fly a map of the environment, and then you actually can navigate in this map. So and we implemented this uh, all on this drone here. So here you can see an experiment where we do a flight and where we do such a mapping directly on site. So this is actually in front of our, our office building. So we have our drone and we actually fly high up and then we take a couple of pictures. Uh, but just some predefined flight pattern or some manner of flight. And a map is now processed from these pictures uh, online during flight, so it takes approximately 1.5 minutes. And then we actually have the capability of flying within this map, navigating within this map. So here you can see our structure from motion pipeline, how it looks like. So images are added, the 3D reconstructions are created. And this 3D reconstruction is then used as a map, as a navigation map. So such a navigation map looks like this. So we don't need a high, f high fidelity, high quality texture 3D model, but what we need is a, a map that actually can be interpreted uh, by, a, by a path planning algorithm. So this is basically a voxel grid that was created. And here an operator can define you want to go here or here or here, and the drone always will find an obstacle-free uh, path to this. So can see this in the video. So the drone is the track, and we can see it actually where it's flying. And as an operator, you know, now you could click on one of the positions, and then a new path is computed in real time to go there. This is what you can see now. Operator is publishing a new point, and then the drone is going there, avoiding the obstacle that is nose that are in the map here. See the drone is then going there. So this is very nice. This allows you to take a drone, uh, take, take it out, employ it in an environment, do this mapping on site during while the drone is flying. So you don't need to carry some uh, computer actually to control it. This is done on board. And after one minute, you have the capability of flying around in this area, uh, avoiding all these obstacles in there. It's also having path planning. Uh, this, in this video, it's controlled by a path planning or a remote control? By path planning. So you only need to give it a location in the map. What was the algorithm you used? I think this is an RLT, path planning algorithm. So we, we have some. So the, this path planning has some modification. It looks for an energy efficient uh, and smooth trajectory. So there's actually a publication on how on this specific variant. The Journal of Field Robotics. So this is very nice. So 
this is a lot of computer vision algorithms on the drone. So it is a structure from motion system with uh, 3D reconstruction. So typically you use this on workstations. So we actually had to basically uh, slim this down to, to, to run on this onboard processor. But once you have this, you can actually do a lot of nice things with the drones in this area. So another application is, um, but another interesting thing for, for drone navigation is for acquisition planning. So m lots of drones are used for mapping. So you <clears throat> take pictures, create 3D measurements, 3D reconstructions of houses, sites, or many objects. So and typically you have to do this manually as a pilot. You have to go there, fly up, and then define maybe some simple pattern for taking images there, and then hope you will get nice images to be able to compute nice 3D measurements from your object. So we want to automize this process. We want actually in a way that you take your drone, go up, then get a live view point on the object you want, and then the drone is doing everything itself. Taking, planning a nice path, taking the right images, such that you are guaranteed to get the best possible 3D reconstruction or measurement from this. So we did such a system, and there we used a lot of techniques from computer vision. So one is uh, semantic segmentation. So basically we fly with the drone there, we do semantic segmentation, then we actually know where buildings are, where vegetation is, where road is. So we now can point on one of the objects, and then the drone actually knows which object we are interested in. So if you click here, then it knows that this building is of interest and it knows the extent of it. And then, this gives the possibility together with some initial, so if we fly up, take a couple of images, we can do a semantic segmentation of these images. So here we of course use some uh, deep learning methods, some continents for doing the semantic segmentation. Uh, and we also get some initial depth map, so we know the height and the metric dimensions of these objects, and then we can use this information to compute an optimal uh, path around uh, the building of interest to capture the images we need to satisfy some uh, geometric constraints that we want, the resolution that we want to take these images and some accuracies. And we can also do more. We can create a plan, um, image acquisition plan that satisfies some safety constraints. For instance, uh, we could restrict this the drone flight to not fly over other buildings or to not fly over parking lots or cars. So here these are cars, so actually we don't want to our drone fly over cars or maybe bystanders that are there. So the trajectory should be planned in such a way automatically that all these sensitive uh, areas are avoided. So we did such an optimization algorithm that can include all these constraints, uh, such for our example, if you wanted to reconstruct this building, we get such a plan. So we avoid, we avoid the road here, we avoid the other building. So this is all done automatically. And the views are selected in such a way that we also get good views from the facades, not just from the top, and that certain overhangs are also nicely lit. So when using such a path as compared to a, sim a simple uh, circle around the object, you get some real benefits, you get the better 3D reconstruction. Uh, this is also what we could show in a publication. So this is the one from the optimized path, this is the one from the simple path. So here we have artifacts that are not here. You can also see that we have errors in the 3D reconstruction compared to ground growth color-coded that uh, these errors are lower here when we do this the optimized path planning. And it's basically fully automatic. So you can, as a user, you don't need to remote control your drone. You need to click on the object that you're interested in, and then it's doing everything on its own. OK. So this was basically the, the main part of my talk. But now come to an end by showing you some videos of some other cool projects uh, that we are working on. 
So I actually don't have a video about uh, inspection tasks, so we are working about some power pylon inspection, and we have some specifics with the reconstruction system that can reconstruct such wiry objects. And within this project, we also have some semantics for the reconstruction. So we create a semantically a 3D reconstruction, fill this with semantic information, and then we can do some automatic reasoning when we have this. So, for instance, power companies are interested in how far is the vegetation uh, from the power lines. Um, does it grow too close? And here we devised a system that knows in the 3D data where vegetation is, where power lines is. And if some vegetation is too close to power lines, it automatically can uh, point out these areas, and in here, this would be these red areas. They are too close, they need to be cut. So no human needs to interpret this, needs to look, there is a vegetation, there is a power line measure this distance, so this is all done automatically. By using this semantic information, by having a semantic uh, interpretation of the data that actually tells you these two classes are too close. How easy it is to find the power lines? <laughs> so the power lines are easily visible in the image data. So standard 3D reconstruction algorithms will not be able to match this. So if you use Agisoft, for instance, it will not be able to reconstruct these power lines. Mm -hmm. So we have a specific 3D reconstruction software that reconstructs lines. lines. And then we have these lines in 3D. Okay. Mm -hmm. And for trading this classifier, we took some data. So we created a semantic drone data set. So it's a lot of images taken from drones, including some urban scenes with people in there, with houses, bikes. So, and then we created some uh, ground truth for them for training a machine learning system. So if you're interested in this, you can actually don download this from our web page, drone data set. Uh, and I think it's, it's a very nice data set and very useful. Okay, I promised you a video. So this is what I would like to show you, I think, as the, the final video. So we had a project with the Austrian Postal Service to show the possibilities of doing some drone delivery. So in Austria, we have a lot of mountains. There are huts on these mountains. And when you want to go there, you have to drive windy roads. And typically, the Postal Service does not go up there. So the idea was, can we bring mail to, this, to the people that are living up there? And the idea, of course, was using drones for this. So, and we actually created a showcase project uh, doing this, and we produced a very nice uh, video to show this. So, what we did in there is we used the computer vision system for automatic land. So, we, our delivery prototype is a very simple drone, so it's not really designed to be a good delivery drone, but the computer vision system there was able to automatically find a landing spot. So the customer had to roll out a mat, and then the drone would go on, on to the GPS location indicator and look for the mat, and then it would land with centimeter precision on it. So if you looked at the recent Amazon rollout of the drone, they also used a mat like this. So I think it's a good idea. Okay, I will show you this nice video now to finish my talk. <coughs> So this is how it looks like there, a uh, lot, lot of steep roads and not many houses there. And the idea is that if you want to send mail to one of these houses, then a drone on the back of this truck goes up there, delivers the, the mail, and then goes back to wherever this vehicle is on its way. It will continue delivering some other mail in between. So we created, so we partnered up with a company that has some electric vehicle like this. Uh, and we, well, we created this small prototype of putting the, the drone on the back. So the mechanism for attaching the packet is really simple, so this is not something that should go into production. Uh, this was not our main priority. You can see this is also this DJI drone that we were using, so it's a limited in range, of course. Uh, but actually, it worked very well for, for our prototype here. So on its way, it crosses all the nice uh, mountain areas here.
So now it comes close to the target location. And there you can see the, the mat that is used. And the drone is then zooming in on this mat and delivering the, the parcel there. And the customer is happy. So the, the key message, so the computer vision is an integral part of this, of this package delivery to find the landing spot. So and this is actually what we have been doing this. Uh, the measurements from the landing spot were used to control the drone and the descending flight to actually hit it precisely. So this, of course, is a really important part of such a delivery system. Uh, it would need more. You also would need to detect obstacles that are in the way, keeping uh, far from... Uh, from persons that may, might be there, then maybe avoiding really delivering the package if there's something in between. So actually what you would need is a really a full semantic interpretation of this landing area. I think this is what you really need, but this can be done with machine learning as well. Okay, uh, with this I would like to uh, end my talk. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer some questions. Yes, please. Do your drones recognize rain? Like, does it give any problems to um, edge detection? Rain? That's a good point. So, typically, we don't fly our drone when it's raining because actually, then we would need to cover all the electronics. So, rain, of course, is a problem for computer vision systems. So, I think light rain can be compensated for with strong rain. I don't know actually what is the plan if you want to fly drones in strong rain at all. I'm not sure. Ah, uh, yes. Is there a fuzzy mapping uh, video that you showed us which had all spike cameras? Were you actually using all five stereo cameras for the mapping or were you just using a few? Mm -hmm. It's a good point. So these stereo cameras, they are low resolution cameras. So they are used actually for detecting obstacles up to four meters. So for the mapping, they are not good enough. So for the mapping, we use this higher resolution camera. So you notice there was also another camera on, on board. This is, these are the images that we used for creating the initial map. That's a stereo high resolution camera? This, no, it's a, single, it's, a, it's a single camera. You take multiple pictures, and then you can compute the 3D reconstruction. Oh. So but you mentioned that for uh, the slam that you require depth, which in indoor settings, you got it with the depth. Uh, camera, but for outdoor case, the monitor one, did you estimate it using? Uh, so this initial, this this initial map was not computed with the Riesland method. This was computed with a traditional structure for motion pipeline. Because we only took a couple of images, like 50 images, to compute this. So there was no SLAM procedure. With that same example, what were you using for localization when you were done mapping and you were down on the ground and flying around the obstacles? For localization, so this was outdoors, so there we could use GPS. Okay. So there was no, no slam used in there. Right, so if the world changed, you would hit the thing? Well, if the, of course. So the map only contains the static parts. Right. So, but for dynamic objects, we have all these uh, stereo sensors on the drone that would detect them. Okay. So it would stop but it would not update the map so far. So this is some future work. We actually want to use this information to update this map. Thanks. Uh, yes? Please. I noticed that uh, in all your work, you find features and then uh, you match. Uh, is there any reason why you are avoiding the optical flow? So the 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 edge-based SLAM does not do feature detection and matching. So this does not do this. So this is one idea to go beyond this feature extraction. Um, if you have scenarios where you have wide baselines, then you still need to do this feature detection. So optical flow between wide baselines uh, is, is complicated still. So in this case, we use the feature-based methods, like, for instance, for this initial mapping here. Does this answer your question? Yes, please. Yeah. I'm curious uh, if you could uh, 
discuss how the scene reconstruction algorithms quantify a certainty? So when you build a map from, from the images, um, how exactly do you quantify the uncertainty in, in that map? And then do you use that uncertainty in some way for path planning and so on? So when we do this 3D reconstruction, so what you could can do is actually you can propagate the uncertainties of the structure of a motion system into the 3D map. So you basically know for every point reconstruction and the uncertainty about this. So this is what what this know. So and you can then actually uh, you can then use this uncertainty for the fusion step into such a voxel grid. So this is important if you have measurements from different distances. So in our case, we fly at one height, so basically everything is at the same distance, so they share, they have the same uncertainty. So there was no need, so we didn't explicitly add these uncertainties into the map. So about the, for the path planning there, so there was a, a safety distance parameter that tells one basically how far you should be away. And of course, this one was tuned to the uncertainties that we have in our measurement system. But here I would actually uh, ask to do more, to actually do some semantic interpretation of these images, to, for instance, increase safety distance for different objects. Like for persons, you would like to keep a much uh, bigger safety distance than for uh, trees, for instance. So this would actually be a very cool idea of adding to it. Uh, is the drone market ready? To sell? Is it market ready to sell? Yeah. Which one? The drone you show on the delivery drone. Yeah, delivery drone. The delivery drone. No. Um, no, it's not. Okay. Because it does not it doesn't have a proper delivery uh, package handling mechanism. So it's not. This was a demonstrator. Uh, shows some pieces of the technology. Necessary, but it's not a ready-made product. Uh, yes. So, in order to detect that landing position, did you just did you use a object detection using deep learning or something, or was it just a color block segmentation? Well, in this case, this was a this was an in April tag. So you can use such an April data detector. So if you use, this was a, a specific pattern, you, you can directly look for such a pattern. Uh, of course, deep learning would be a good idea. It would work perfectly, absolutely. But it was, was not needed there. Uh, the delivery drone, uh, yes? what's the estimated cost in now? The estimated cost in now? The uh, product manufacturing. Well, th this delivery drone was based on a DJI product, so you need to buy the DJI frame, and this DJI matrix was about, I think it's about $6,000. It's not built anymore, so, but there you actually can manufacture your, your own one. Mm. Okay. No more questions. Let's thank the speaker for the nice talk and let's thank Dr. Martin.